Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 103 of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your co-host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. Cannoli Fingers, and I'm joined here by my suave co-host, former market maker of 20 years and current day retail trader, the man who gave House Street its infamy, the man who sold more paper than Xerox, he taught you how to think like a villain. JJ, how's it going? Good, brother. How are you? I'm excited, man. I'm doing really good. Because our guest today is a trailblazer in the online brokerage industry, driving innovation and financial education for investors of all level. A former floor trader, he built a breakthrough options trading platform, Thinkorswim, later sold to TD Ameritrade. He offers up his expertise in options markets as co-host of Tasty Live. I think you guys already know who I'm talking about, Tom Sosnoff. Tom, how's it going, man? I'm happy to be here. Looks Sounds like fun. Looks like fun. It, it, it sure is. Hopefully, it'll be a lot of fun, Tom. I, I just want to uh, start the conversation off um, with your time as a floor trader um, and, and a market maker in Chicago. Here on the podcast, we love hearing about people's time um, on the floor. So I guess you could just start us, uh, start us off with um, your start in trading, uh, how you got your initial job. So I'm a lot older than you guys. And I, <laughs> I, when I graduated, I went to school in upstate New York, you know, state school. And um, when I graduated college, they, it was the end of, it was like 1979, 1980, when, when interest rates were like 20%. And, you know, it was pretty high unemployment and there wasn't a lot of jobs for, for new college graduates. And so the first interview I got was on Wall Street. And they offered me a job. So I took it, even though I was a political science major, even though I had no idea what finance was about, just took the job on Wall Street and started my career, um, you know, down on 60 Broad Street. And then about six or seven months into, you know, working for a big broker firm, I was working for Drexel at the time, Drexel Burnham, they're no longer Mm -hmm. around, but um, they were like the premier boutique firm. And I met these guys, learned how to you know, trade options. Cause it was, I was learning on their trade desk and I just, somebody offered me a job cause I was young and single to move to Chicago. They put up the money. I moved to Chicago and I was like, screw it. I'll do it. And I think I was 23 and I just loaded up my car, Toyota Celica back then <laughs> first new car I ever owned <laughs> and wow. drove to Chicago. I had never been like, you guys remember the, um, you remember the the New Yorker cartoon where like the if you grow up in New York, like the end of the world pretty much ends at the end of the <laughs> East River. Like nobody ever goes outside. That was me. I had never wow. been west of East River in New York. And like going out to Chicago, I didn't even know where it was. Like I'd never been west of the Mississippi. I didn't even know if it was east, west, whatever. Um <laughs> so I went out to Chicago and I've been here for, you know, basically since 1981. Um, wow. so it's been 20, uh, 42 years in this business. I started on the floor the first day I got to Chicago. I went on the floor of the SIBO. Um, the guys from New York, they blew out like a month later and I was just stuck here and uh, um, built up, a, you know, built up a pretty good career. So, nice. you know, that's that, it. That's, nice. that's my whole story in a nutshell. Yeah, no, it's real interesting that you didn't, you didn't really have any interest um, in trading or the markets at first. What, what were your first like initial thoughts uh, when you first started getting involved? You know, so so I didn't really know much about trading at all. I, I, I was kind of learning about finance, like when I got the job, but I didn't really understand like trading and open outcry. And so I, I took a trip to Chicago, flew out to Chicago once with and and somebody set me up with with a tour of the floor. And I walked onto the floor of the SIBO. This is this was like, you know, 1981. And all it was was a bunch of like and it was a really old crappy building and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> It's like on the it was like on the basement of the board of trade, and and because the, the option exchange was kind of small, and I walked on the floor and there was like a thousand guys screaming and yelling. It was completely up for grabs, and I love chaos, you know, and I love to gamble and I love chaos, you know, and and I walked on this floor. I'm like, oh my god, I got to like I quit the next day, like I was literally the next day like I'm going to Chicago. This is the greatest place where I don't know if I'm going to make it, but like to me it felt like the last frontier. Mm. And, you know, the last kind of frontier of like true capitalism. I mean, mm. I didn't even know what was going on. Yeah. And I was like, I got to be there. Take my shot. You, were you know, when you're 22 or 23, 
who cares, right? It doesn't matter. You can take your shot then. Mm -hmm. So that was it. Go ahead, JJ. You got some? No, that's just amazing. I'm I'm just, I've been waiting 10 years to meet you because I, I always tell people, if not for you, I would never have learned how to trade retail. You know, I, I directed order flow to market makers for 20, 25 years and did deals to companies public, liquidated the stock into retail buying and created markets to sell into. But when it came to retail trading, I had no idea what to do. And in 2012, this kid said, you got to watch Tasty Trade. And because I'd been going from place to place to place. And all these people were like, you know, I'm a waiter. Now I'm teaching trading. It was the first time that you know, there was two old floor traders. And I was like, oh, God, I'm home. Like, I felt because those are the guys who trained me, right? I saw you and Bat, and I saw the way you were interacting. I'm like, oh, these guys know what they're doing. I'm just going to stick with them. And then I found Peter Resnicek and then the market profile guys with Tim Dalton. Got it. And if not for started, you guys. I started those guys, you know. I know, I, I know. Back in the toss days, yeah. Oh, my God. And if not for those guys, I would have gone back to doing deals because retail trading, I could not figure it out. You know, and I still remember watching like Liz and Jenny. And, sure, they're still here. Yeah, and I, still, but I couldn't understand together. a thing they were saying, you know, yeah. because I knew nothing about options. So I was like, oh my god, you know, like I can I can make markets in twenty different companies simultaneously, but I can't figure out how to trade one e mini, you know. Yeah. And it was it was just soul destroying. And then you guys were like this beacon of light. So I I have to thank you for that. I'm so grateful. Love it. Love it. You know? That's awesome. And, and uh, and also watching you and Bat because my partner was for Italian from, you know, from Long Island. So, you know, I, I felt immediately at home, you know, when I was watching you and bat the way you guys interact and give each other a hard time and the stories and, and stuff like that. And it I'm was from uh, Brooklyn, New York, Long Island, they're all the same. Yeah. <laughs> Throw them in with a bunch of Jews. It's all the same. It doesn't matter. You know, you know I, I did, my guys were all market makers out of, out of Jersey city. Right. And uh, yeah. back in the nineties. So that's where I, I just immediately felt at home with you guys. And thank God for that, because otherwise I couldn't figure out these candle patterns and all this stuff. And so it, it took me a while, but I'm, I'm so grateful. And, and meeting you is just like, this is great. You know, I, I, I was so excited all day. You know, I kept ready. Are we sure it's 1230? You know, like I was like, I'm like a little kid, you know. <laughs> That's cool. I love it. Yeah. All right, so, so we'll just take a, a quick second here to shout out uh, sponsors of the podcast, Apex Trader and Top Step Funding. Any listener of this podcast that has the skills to pass an evaluation can become a prop trader fully funded by either Apex or Top Step Funding. Our own micro e-futures trading community has many members who are now fully funded. No need to trade with your own money. Keep 90% of the profits. To learn more, you visit our website at microefutures.com. Yeah, Tom, I, I love I love hearing about the the environment of the floor and how it just like encapsulates people. Uh, you know, the, the energy. Uh, it's you know, it's just a shame. I guess it's not like that anymore. Oh, no, it's uh, gone. It's gone now. But it was it was amazing. You know, I wouldn't trade it for anything. But it's gone now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunate. But I I want to ask you. Uh, I, I like asking all the guests this. You know, people look at you. You know, revere you, etc. But I, I'm just curious to. Uh, maybe your learning curve to trading when you first started, like maybe some of the struggles um, you had, if if any. Oh my God. Well, when I first started, when I first got to the floor, it took me probably two or three months before I even understood like half the, remember I didn't, I didn't grow up. I just ended up there the first day. I couldn't understand what anybody was saying. Like they were talking a different language. I didn't understand the hand signals. I didn't understand all the slang. I didn't understand like the whole game, you know, like it really, I, I just didn't get it. And then you start watching like these, these, you know, people would say like, Hey, this guy over here is a really good trader. You know? So you start like watching them and try to learn, but I had no clue for the first two or three months, like what, what was happening? Like I didn't have any idea. Then I figured it out. Um, they, they introduced like an index product back then called SP 100. It was the OEX. And when they introduced that, I finally had a place to go where there was an, where there was a lot of other like newbies because like nobody was established there. Mm, so we kind of I kind of lived in that pit for then and and you know and made that my home for the next you know almost almost twenty years. And so, um, you know, you figure it out. It, it's basically you eat what you you know you eat what you kill. Mm. So if you don't figure it out pretty like usually you have enough money to last a couple of months, and then if you don't figure it out for a couple of months, you're pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. But if you figure it out, you can survive for, you know, pretty much forever back then. 
now it's a whole different game but back then you know so so i was a survivor yeah yeah interesting so i, I like so you kind of found like your own like little niche in a, in a new uh area or new market well you know what's weird about the trading floor back then is it every single it's mostly guys there was a few women you know like a handful a few dozen but mostly you know thousands of guys and they come and go because most people blow out. It's like, you know, 80, 85 to 95% of the people blow out or they just don't like it or whatever it is. And the few that are, that survive, you know, they're, they're all, they're all the same personalities. They're all, you know, stupid egomaniacs, all alpha males. Everybody's got, you know, everybody's tougher than the next, you know, it's just, it's all, it's all bullshit. <laughs> Cause they're all, everybody's fun. And, and they're, they're actually still my friends this day, but imagine like, JJ, imagine like, you know, 3000 Tony Batistas, you know, oh when, they're, when they're 20, when they're 24 years old. Oh yeah. And that's hockiness and things like that. Oh, was, yeah. It was off the I... charts, but, oh, you man, know, and then back in the eighties, you know, there's a lot of drugs and everything else. <laughs> and so, you know, and a lot of stupid kids with a lot of money, you know, we were making, we we're making so much money in the eighties. I couldn't even, I couldn't even tell my parents, you know, like it was, it was, <laughs> it was weird. It was just a weird, you know, way to, you grew up like, like what athletes, what I, I'll tell you a good story. I got a really good story. You'll like good, this. Good. So we had um, we had floor seats at the to the Bulls at the old Chicago Stadium when when the Bulls drafted Jordan, wow. and and he was a rookie. So we would go to every game, and our seats were right next to the Bulls bench. And one night, Jordan leaned over and he goes, "Someday, I just want to make as much money as you guys." <laughs> <laughs> We frame, I wish we could have digitized and made that oh. into an NFT oh, because yeah. we go, you're going to do that. <laughs> like <laughs> we're pretty confident you're going to get there. Yeah. And, um, but that's what it was like, you know, in the, in the early eighties, you know, I was like, that's, you know, it was a stupid life and, yeah. and, wow. you know, but most people, we used to say, if you make a million dollars and you lose a million dollars, you're down a million dollars because you blew it all. Sure. You know, like, like it was, we had, it was, it was kind of a stupid time, but it was, it was it was weird and and you know we we figured it out we survived yeah i mean i met tony in 1981 or 1982 you know i mean it's, that's wow. how long we've been friends you know like and, but he not just him you know scott and i have been friends in since you know the mid 80s too it's crazy yeah incredible i i i love hearing about those those stories man just there's different times now um yeah it's different uh, it's nothing now it's all servers and you know it's exactly. servers and everything is perfectly, you know, efficient and it's everything is has a perfect theoretical value. Back then it was kind of the wild, wild west. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'd imagine, um, Tom, your trading has evolved over the time um as well. Do you do you remember how you were trading back then? I'm I I can't it's hard yeah, to yeah. I mean them. I yeah. traded very aggressively throughout most of my career on the floor. I mean, you know, there was a handful of us, you know, I would say like the top, you know, five or 10% of all the traders in Chicago had a different kind of lifestyle. And I probably, you know, made it into that group. You know, I wasn't in the top 1%, but probably in the top five or something like that. And, and that was a pretty good life, you know, obviously, but my trading style back then was pretty much, you know, go big or go home type thing. You know, it was, it was, you were very aggressive. Like you just, you didn't, you didn't want anybody to be bigger than you. You didn't want anybody to make more money than you, you know, and now, and but I don't I don't know what I knew. Like I learned the 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 guts of the business, but I really didn't learn the nuances of the business. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until after we left the trading floor um, and built Thinkorswim that I started to learn about kind of like you know how to build technology, um, how to put everything that I had learned in the prior twenty years to use. You know how to kind of build up a methodology. I can trade completely different today, but I'm. I'm just as bad a junkie as I was, you know, 40 years ago. Like I'm, I'm a true junkie, but I, but I, I just trade differently today. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so I guess I got, a, I got a couple of things cause this leads into a uh, think or swim, um, which I want, definitely want to ask you about a little bit more too. So, uh, you know, I, I, th I think of, um, Trading is a, it could be similar to sports in certain respects uh, that it's, you know, performance based, <laughs> but, you know, we can perform way longer in, you know, into our age. Would you say the, the you had a prime in trading at a time or do you feel like you just still just continue to get better and better as time goes on? Um, well, you know, there were two different eras. Like, you know, it's very different to, to be a screen based trader than to be, you know, in the pits sure. with open outcry. 
Um, the, the open outcry part of the business doesn't exist anymore. I, I would say I didn't, I did that from my early twenties to my early forties, you know, so, so it wasn't, so I didn't really feel like, you know, there was a prime in there. I, I think the markets, you know, would present you with opportunity based on just whatever was happening. So you couldn't really look at it as, Hey, I'm, I'm a better trader today. I mean, clearly I was a better trader five years after I started than the, than when I started. But if I was a better trader 10 or 15 years later, I don't know, probably about, pretty close to the same. Mm -hmm. I think on, on the retail side now, you know, as a screen-based trader, I'm definitely a better trader today than I was 10 years ago, than I was five years ago. I mean, we learn, we have learned so much from building Thinkorswim and then building Tasty, and mostly from building Tasty. Mm -hmm. um, we've, you know, we've, we have, we've built this think tank. We have this amazing technology today. And I think we've just, every day we've learned stuff. So, so yeah, I mean, we've definitely learned a lot more in the last 10 years than I learned in the first 30 years. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, that's that's very interesting. Do you think you having experience on the floor, um, being someone who's you know learned you know the just the the nuts and bolts of the business or like being in the business, um, gave you gave you an advantage coming into retail trading, or do you think it maybe hurt you in certain respects? I, I guess just kind of just speak to that. Um. I don't think it gave me, I mean, obviously the know-how part of it gave me, you know, some advantage at first. I don't think, um, I don't think we have any advantage. Like, I don't think I have an advantage today over like, let's say JJ trading or somebody else trading. I, I don't think I have any advantage um, because I have a lot of other distractions and it, they're self, you know, they're self-inflicted, self-imposed. But I, so I don't really necessarily think that I have any advantage over anybody else. Um, but I think that, you know, there, there are certain, I've had certain experiences which give me confidence that I think maybe some people don't have, you know, with respect to certain situations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, so yeah, so, so think, uh, think or swim, um, obviously highly influential, um, in the trading space, uh, yeah, just, sure. Yeah, just you just give us like a run rundown, just kind of from where this idea came from, to you know down through the eventual sale. So in early, it's probably around early 1999, and we're in the middle of that crazy dot com boom. And um, how old are you? How old are you? I'm 31. 31. I'm 50, so, I'm so basically, you know, you're you're. <laughs> I was young. Yeah. <laughs> you're young. You're young. young. And, and so, um, so 1999 like was this crazy period where everything with a dot com on the end you know was was going crazy and oh, yeah. um and and we were trading index products so where i was trading wasn't crazy it was just you know things things kind of weirded up in 1999 we we're going into the kind of the changing of of you know going from 1999 to 2000 and the y2k and everybody was freaking out over that and it was a time when when i sensed that we were going to be Within a short period of time, the markets were going to go to being coming much more automated, much more server based. I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't see a world where in 2009 there would still be open outcry. Like I, I, I just saw the changes were happening and they were happening really fast. So I had this idea that we would build something. And, and remember, we weren't technologists. So I had this idea we'd build something that was different. And I had this. I was walking through my house one night and and I called Scott and I said, hey, I can't come up with this crazy name, Think or Swim. And I got this idea to build this, you know, multifaceted financial service company where we'll do a bunch of different things. We'll manage money, we'll create options on anything, and we'll build a brokerage. It had crazy parts. And I go, he goes, Well, how much is it going to cost? I go, it's everything we've made over the last 20 years. And he's <laughs> like, and and we were partners, and he goes, and he goes, and I go, don't tell your wife. Like, don't tell her anything. <laughs> and I go, I'm not telling my wife anything. Don't tell your wife anything. Just say, yes, you want to do it or no. And I'll, I'll, it's cool. I'll understand. And he goes, I'm in. And so at that point, we basically took everything we had made over the, per, over the last, you know, 15, 20 years together. And we rolled it into, you know, Thinkorswim. And we didn't know anything about building technology and, and so we just, we, we were pretty good entrepreneurs because we had built a pretty cool business, prop trading and, yeah. and lots of different, you know, um, money management and all these things, but we hadn't really ever gotten into, um, you know, any kind of technology. And 
we decided to go for it and it, it kind of worked, you know, but you, you don't, you don't know that at the time. Yeah. That's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's amazing. Sorry. Let me jump in as a trader and actually taking companies public and created product. I, I find your journey amazing because not only did you create think or swim, then you created, you know, a financial sort of an ecosystem with tasty trade yeah. and, and brought people in. And then you went and created the small exchange and then you actually created your own product, right? Which, which is, I think that's amazing. That is like going from, that's every floor trader's dream from trading this stuff or for me, a desk trader to actually creating the product that other people trade every day and then providing the ecosystem where they can learn and you can keep them in the game and keep them trading. You know, that's, that's quite amazing. You know, so from a creator standpoint, um, and the amount of regulatory burden that you must have gone through doing these things like thinkorswim is a registered brokerage, you know, compliance and all of those things, and to having your own exchange and the compliance issues around having an exchange and clearing. And I mean, those things are, I mean, I find that astounding. That's why I'm just in awe. There's, and, there's a lot of hurdles, JJ. I mean, like, you know, but you just, you deal with that stuff. It's not, yeah. you know, nothing ever is easy. So exactly. we didn't, you know, and remember, we never had a job before. We never had worked for anybody. So yeah. it wasn't like we were, you know, we weren't really used to, we didn't expect anybody to give us anything. So, so we just kind of put our heads down. We put together a really good team at Thinkorswim we first started and, and, you know, who knew? And we built some crazy cool technology on the backs of a bunch of young developers that we found. And um, we're still with them today. That's and you know, we kept the whole team together. When we sold Thinkorswim, we brought everybody back together and started Tasty. It was the exact same team. Nice. So we did it again, which is which is really cool. And that's that was what I wanted our legacy to be, really. And it, in quite a legacy it is. I'm just uh, I'm just in awe of it. I think a lot of people who are trying to create things and things like that should look at your story and and you know take notes. Definitely. There's a, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there for sure. And, and, you know, there, there's not, it's not like there wasn't times when, you know, things get ugly and, you know, there wasn't there, there's definitely situations where, you know, you wonder, is this all going to work or, you know, how's this going to play out? But I, I don't know, maybe we don't, maybe the prior 20 years and just taking a, a, a crap load of risk, you know, got us through all that. And it's, it's nice too, that you actually, when you find the bid, you hit it. I mean, you know, you, uh, you know, you know, you were out of toss and then tasty trade with IG is, uh, yeah, but you know, it's funny. We didn't, we didn't like, um, we built toss. We didn't have a, we really didn't have much interest in what we were. I mean, I shouldn't say we didn't have a, we had a lot of people were interested in what we were doing, but, but we were kind of like the black sheep of the, you know, of that industry. So we didn't really 10 years after we started, we had, um, three cash bids for, for Thinkorswim. And then we chose the TD Ameritrade one because, um, we wanted their stock rather mm -hmm. than cash. Um, nice. and it's kind of a cool story. Um, I should tell you this cause it's, it's an interesting story, but when we sold, uh, when we sold Thinkorswim, the market was crapping out. It was 2008, you know, oh, it was wow. the end of 2008, 2009. And, you know, our stock at at one point it was over a billion dollars, and then it had sold off to like you know, six hundred or seven hundred million, and so our stock was cheap. But TD Ameritrade stock was had gone from like thirty down to ten, or actually like eleven or something. So their stock was dirt cheap, and all the financial stocks in that two thousand eight two thousand nine you know period had gotten killed. So they wanted to do a full cash deal. And, and we didn't want to, because we're like, you know, cash isn't your stocks. We'd rather own your stock at $11 or $12, oh, whatever yeah. it was, than have the cash for the deal. Cause I'm, I'm more bullish, you know, cause the thing that people didn't realize in 2008 and 2009 is our business was, was, was going up by like 50% a year yeah. and the stock was going down by 50%. Yeah. So I'm like, this is fucked up. You know, there are, our market cap has dropped by three or four hundred million dollars, and our business has doubled. Like amazing. When when everybody figures this out, you know these stocks yeah, exactly, are exactly exactly. But so so TD had cash, but they didn't have any stock. 
So at oh, the really? time, yeah, but but here's a crazy story. So at the time, the Ricketts who owned TD, they decided that they, at the exact same time, just purely coincidental, they decided that they wanted to buy the Cubs. I don't know if you remember oh, the whole okay. thing, yeah. but the Ricketts, yep. the Ricketts were going to buy the Cubs from the Tribune Company. So the Ricketts needed cash to buy the Cubs. TD needed stock to buy us. Oh, so we did a three-way deal. Nice. Where, and so we did a three-way deal on the same day where, oh, wow. where TD bought their stock back from the Ricketts, yeah. gave it to us, and yeah. and then they gave the Ricketts cash to buy the Cubs. Beautiful. And it turned out to be a good deal for everybody because TD stock you know, tripled. Yeah. The, the value of the Cubs tripled, and we yeah. got ours and you know, we got our money and yeah. moved on. And we kept their nice. stock. That's oh, crazy story, but um, but really weird how stuff happens that way. That's amazing. That that could almost be like that. That's almost like the uh, barbarians at the gate story a little bit, you know, <laughs> with uh, you know how deals get done. You yeah. know, having done so deals, a couple of yeah deals are they're amazing. I love to to see how you know the inner workings of them are. When we <laughs> sold, when we sold, um, Tasty. Now, here's another situation. We built Tasty in 2010, 2011. We started, we launched it. And for 10 years, not one person talked to us about, you know, about buying us or anything like that. And we didn't, we didn't get a single inquiry. In 2021, really? kind of after the kind of pandemic wound down a little bit, five different companies bid for Tasty behind, you know, bid for us. And we settled on one that was global because we... We wanted to expand globally and we didn't want to do a SPAC. And I think it. not doing a yeah. SPAC was really smart. <laughs> definitely. Um, but... <laughs> definitely. Because yeah. once those guys blow out of their paper, they leave everybody hanging, you know? And yeah, the, the SPAC would have been a disaster. No matter how good we no matter how good the firm is, the SPAC yeah. would have been would have been crap. Yeah. Um but you know, we think we picked we think we picked the right firm. You know, I mean, time will tell. Um, yeah. but we liked their business and it gave us global expansion and um, so, and you know, and you, you're right. You can't pick the time. Like if you have to sell, you'll never sell yeah. yet. You have to sell when somebody wants to buy you. You can't sell exactly. when you want to sell. Got to sell into strength. That's what we learn on, in, on the desk, you know? Yeah. You sell into strength. Yeah. Basically that's right. you raise money when you can, not when you have to. Exactly. That's, that's beautiful. It's just, uh, I, I love hearing about these things because, you know, you, you did it twice now and, uh, we're, we're waiting for the now we're, what's the third act going to be? You know, I, mean, I remember, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I remember telling people this tasty trade, this thing's going to be worth a lot one day. And people are like, really? It's just, I'm like, look what they're doing. They've got an ecosystem and they're the only people who are harvesting those retail investors and they're out there and, and they have no direction. You know, they're going on YouTube and they're listening to people, you know, who are talking about buying Lamborghinis. You guys are the only ones who are actually have a vested interest in education. Right. And that is going to grow and build. And it, it did. You know? you know what I loved about tasty and, and it came up with the idea for tasty and in, in like in, in probably 2007, 2008, but I was too busy, you know, I was too, too busy and too emerged in the whole think or something at the time. But once we sold it and, you know, I had to stay on for, uh, usually when you sell a business, you have to stay on for the transition period, things like that. So I had to sign like a multi-year deal to stay on a TD, but, um, and I liked them. They were nice. I liked the CEO. He was a great guy and, and, and I liked everybody there, but I like, I, I didn't like working for a big company and I never, you know, I never had a job like that. And so I went to the CEO one day and I said, I have this idea for this company. And he's like, Oh my God, what are you going to do now, Tom? And I'm like, I, I want to build this company called tasty trade where we, we'll do content marketing and we'll do a partnership with TD. And he goes, Oh my God, I absolutely freaking hate that idea. <laughs> See, and that's, you know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of when Xerox had the Palo Alto research center Yeah, and, right. they, and they had windows, they had the mouse, they had all of that technology and they'd rather build photocopiers. Right. So, yeah. But let me and tell you look what they lost out. So, so he tells me, he goes, I really hate that idea. I absolutely hate the oh name. God. He goes, I hate the name. I hate the idea. He goes, <laughs> he goes, he goes, um, but then, but you're gonna love this. But then he said, but I refuse to fade. I'm not going to fade you. 
So how much money? He goes, oh, I wow. want to be partners. He goes, so how much money do you want? And I'm like, <laughs> so, so he's like, he's like, I hate everything about this. How much money do you want? So Beautiful. I said, I said, I'll, I'll put up $20 million and you put up $20 million, you know, as yeah. TD. So they were our first partner. Wow. And, but then I never, we never took the money from, we, we only took a small portion of the money from them. And because um, we decided that they, that we'd rather do, you know, we'd rather do a marketing deal with them and have them as a customer than have them as yeah. a partner. Um, because we didn't want their, we didn't want them to own a certain percentage of us that would put them over a threshold for having reporting requirements with, you know, with the regulators. Yeah. So, so even GD. though, so he was totally cool and invested in us. Um, and they were our first investor. Wow. And then a couple of years later, we went to raise money and we went back to the same private equity firm that financed the, um, the Thinkorswim deal, their TCV, they're located in Palo Alto. And same thing, I went in and said, this is what we're doing now. And they said, they, the whole table of these big private equity guys, and they go, we absolutely hate the name. We hate this business. <laughs> this is the worst business, Tom. He goes, oh we loved God. your last business. We hate this business. And, but we're going to give you a check for 25 million <laughs> because you made us money and we'll never turn down somebody that made us money in the past. Amazing. And the second time they made, I don't know, 300 million or something on us. So, Beautiful. so they're not complaining, but that's how these stories go. You know, like, yeah. like if we hadn't been successful the first time, they wouldn't have given us money the second time. That's Amazing. interesting. That's that, that's yeah. That's awesome. That's interesting. Um, Welcome to how private equity works in America. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I love, I, I love it though. Like, well, cause trading's like that sometimes too, I feel like, right. Like it's like, I, I hate this trade, but I know this is fitting my requirements or my system. And like, sometimes those turn out to be like the really good trades ones that are low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all the time. I think it was yeah. Paul Tudor Jones that once said, I, I think I'm quoting the right guy, but I think it was Paul Tudor Jones that once said the trades I love, I get killed on the trades. I hate, I make money on. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's it still fascinates me how that works. Um, that's uh, it's just interesting. Yeah, it's called nobody knows anything. It's yeah. nobody knows anything. <laughs> or trading against your bias, you know. Nobody. Yeah. Knows no, no, you're trading. You're trading against. You, everybody's watching the same movie. You're just trading. You know, you're just you're basically fading exactly what you think, but you think what the way everybody else thinks. Exactly. So it's like it's such yeah. a natural contrarian move. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so since they, they kept saying they hated the name, where, where did tasty trade, where did that, where'd you come up with that name? What's what's the thoughts process behind that? So I'll tell you, so when we owned Thinkorswim, um, it, Thinkorswim was the software based platform. It was, it was like the first, you know, like Java based trading platform. Mm -hmm. And the, a lot of customers that we had couldn't trade through their firewalls at work because they, they weren't allowed to download software. So, we decided we'd build a web-based platform that allowed them to kind of, you know, go around their work firewalls. And I had this idea where I'm going to name the platform, um, the 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 web-based platform, Tasty Trade. Okay, because I I just love the name. You know, I took it from like Tasty Cakes in Philly and Tasty <laughs> Tasty Freeze. You know, stupid yeah. food places. <laughs> okay. And so, um, so I I bought the name, but I bought it with the credit card for the from the company. So you know, for nine ninety five from GoDaddy. Yeah, but nice. when, when TD bought us, they technically bought the name. So when I was negotiating my deal with, when TD bought us, you know, I had to negotiate my next contract with them for, cause I never negotiated before. Cause you know, when you're the CEO, you don't negotiate, you just take whatever. So, so when I'm negotiating the deal, Fred's going to Fred who Tom's echo was the CEO is going back and forth with me on all these, you know, crazy, you know, like, you know, option plans, whatever we're, however I'm negotiating it. And finally he gets really frustrated with me. He goes, listen, you're not getting the freaking private jet. You're not getting all this other crap. I go, I don't want it. I go, I just want one domain name. He goes, what do you want? I, go, I want this domain name called tasty trade. He goes, tasty trade. What's that? I go, it's just a domain name. I bought it for nine 95 with a company credit card. He goes, how much is it worth today? I go nine 95. So, <laughs> He goes, $9.95? I go, yeah. He goes, and that's all you want? And then we're done? I go, yeah. So he goes, the name's yours. We're done. And that's wow. how 
we kept I kept the Tasty Trade name, and that's why when I launched the company, you know, a couple of years later, that's why he was so he, he laughed about it because he's like, yo, that stupid name again. Here it goes, because <laughs> you're never going to be successful with that. That's great. But, you know, listen, it doesn't. You know, we're just having some fun. Just having fun with it. That's all. Stupid awesome. name, but but serious technology. Yeah. So so with Tasty Trade, we uh, you you brought up the uh, the pandemic a little bit earlier. I'm curious yeah. to to what were I guess just your observations, because there was obviously a boom in retail trading uh, with people being home and stuff. Uh, just curious to what some of your observations were uh, during that era. Well, it's funny because um, so so I had worked for a really long time, last 20 some odd years, you know, since we left the trading floor, trying to find, you know, what's going to turn like the mass, like like what is the event or what, you know, um, how are we going to get all these people, especially young people interested in markets? And I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I tried, I tried everything, but I just couldn't figure out like the secret sauce, you know, what? like, like we built an amazing organic company that, that introduced trading to literally to millions of people, but I never could get to that, that crazy, you know, hurdle where, where it like brought in like five or 10 million people type thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what Robinhood essentially did, you know, through the virality of, of their platform and the virality of the release and the timing of everything else, you know, Robinhood really, you know, struck gold with just with that whole movement. And, you know, our business exploded too, but it was much, you know, on a, on a completely different level. So I was not jealous, but I was impressed because that was a transformational moment in the financial service world, you know, in, in, of what happened during that whole kind of, you know, from the pandemic, the pandemic was weird because nobody even knew what a pandemic was, but this, the, the amount of trading from people being at home all the way into the whole meme stock explosion, you know, I, I watched in awe of, you know, Robin Hood being able to accomplish something that, that we had tried to, but just couldn't get over, you know, that, that, that certain demographic, even though our content was better, our technology was better, you know, yeah. everything, everything we did was like mm -hmm. head and shoulders better. Um, I was still, you know, that particular moment was, was so cool to me. And I didn't try to, I didn't think it would last forever, but I thought it was a good like launch point for the next decade or two. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. What what do you think that Robin Hood did well? Um, you know, because I think of Robin Hood, I think of a little, you know, like you already mentioned, your guys' content is better. Um, education, yeah. it's you know, it's professional. Uh yeah. when I think of when I think of Robin Hood, I think a little bit more uh kids just in there firing up, you know, just <laughs> yeah, I mean they 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 you know it's it's weird sometimes certain certain levels of social virality are just really hard to to pinpoint like why it worked you know there are plenty of other companies that that didn't work at all you know and there are plenty of other companies that fail i would argue that you know for as as great as robin hood did it's also they also have a lot of failures on their you know they have some pretty big swings yeah. um but i think that like you know vlad and those i i think they were they're they're really good they just didn't really they 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 made one huge mistake which is they they just couldn't handle the moment when when the shit hit the fan they couldn't handle it and that's because they don't come from that background that trader background exactly. and you know clearing, i mean you know, i think I mean, those guys started on thinkorswim too well that's the thing i mean the, their where they failed was clearing right because where the they failed was, in, was they, yeah. they met a lot of the mechan the, the moment, right. yeah, the, obviously the clearing side, the regulatory side, but, yeah. but really they just weren't big enough for the moment. Yeah. And, they didn't have the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, you know, they, they've suffered, you know, they, they, they've obviously been hurt ever since. Yeah. Not that they're, they're not, listen, they're not hurting. They have $6 billion in cash. Exactly. I mean, they're going to yeah. be just fine, <laughs> but, but they're, um, you know, they, they got damaged, you know, they got damaged. Mm -hmm. One thing was fascinating about that, that I've never seen is I'm used to the street taking a stock and that's when the retail just comes out of nowhere. I've never seen the street take a stock like these meme stocks. Like, yeah, that was I'm a, crazy. I, I'm a dollar volume guy. I mean, like how much dollar yeah. volume did it trade? How much can I sell into that? Yeah. You know, from my clients. 
And yeah. I, I, I mean, the, those things were trading 10, 12 billion dollars worth of dollar volume a day. I've never seen liquidity like that. You know, yeah, the it, just, was, I, it was the, the whole GameStop thing. The whole yeah. GameStop thing was, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll see something like that again yeah. 10 years from now or something. But I think that was just like, think about it as the perfect storm. Oh, yeah. I don't think you can think about it any other way other than it's the perfect storm. And I, you know, I, I don't really look at it any other way. Yeah. yeah. Quite amazing. I was like, you know, how, how come none of my deals were the, <laughs> the street comes in like this? You know, it's like, where were you guys when I have 150 million shares of worthless stock to sell into this, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Don't worry. We were all thinking the exact same thing. There's all the crappy ass stocks that we own. That exactly. Are like, right now. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah. There's certs in the bottom of garbage cans, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, and listen, GameStop was no better, right? Like that's the crappiest stock you've ever seen. Oh, you know? exactly. Yeah. yeah. I know. I know. We're all, they're, they're, I, nobody still get, I, even to this day, I don't get it. Yeah. Incredible. Inc really incredible time to really think about it, to, to reflect on. Um, I thought it was interesting what you said too, Tom. Um, you know, you, you being a, a trader for 20 years, I'm sure uh, the the skills or, or the, the attributes that you learned from trading helped you as as a businessman, you know, like, like you were just mentioning, like maybe the moment being too big or handling stress or having, you know, conviction or, or confidence in yourself, I'm sure helped um, as a businessman. I think that if you go back, if, if like you were to ask Scott or myself, like, you know, about like what's the difference maker? It's that we decided really early on, and and Scott's totally a risk taker, is that every chance we had to take risk, we did. Like we never turned down a deal or turned down, you know, like we don't turn down, just like we don't turn down interviews or whatever it is, we don't turn down podcasts, we don't turn down deals. Like we'll talk to anybody. Um, and we will never turn down an opportunity to take risk. And, and you, you know, you don't realize how many times in your life, you know, you're going to end up in a situation where you have to make a decision that's a risky decision. And most people opt not to take the risk every single time. And we opt to take the risk every single time, no matter what, even when we don't even kind of love the risk reward, we'll still take the risk mm -hmm. because you, you, you'd be surprised how many times you make you know, crappy deals work for you and good deals don't work, you know? So like, it's, it's weird that way, but that's how we think. Yep. Yep. Excellent. Uh, just a couple more questions here, Tom, and we'll get you on sure, your way. Fireway. Appreciate, appreciate your time, man. Um, I guess if you could just um, surmise the best uh, your ability here on a podcast, uh, just your options trading methodology. Um, I'm more than anything else. Um, I would call myself right now a pretty disciplined premium seller. So I am a very broad based, you know, kind of across the board um, vol junkie, that's volatility junkie. And I sell a lot of premium where I think the implied volatility is high. I'm indifferent to product, mm -hmm. um, meaning I don't care if it's, if it's an index, an equity, a future, I don't really care. They're all the same to me. Um, I mean, I trade, I trade some passive instruments too. Like I'll trade some crypto and I'll trade, you know, occasionally some, some stocks, things like that. But um, I'm really kind of an across the board premium seller. Um, I try to keep, I try to keep my deltas intact, you know, either wrapped around zero or, or if I'm a little bullish, I'll keep them long. If I'm a little bearish, I'll keep them short. But I usually try to keep a, a pretty decent amount of, of positive decay theta working for me. And that's my trading style. It's a little bit different. You know, I have the mentality of um, I like the market to beat me rather than I, I don't think I'm that good at trying to beat the market. Mm -hmm. I think I'm better at letting the market try to beat me and then and collecting premium in the process. So that's my style. That's awesome. I, I like the way you you framed that. That's excellent. Um what are what are some of the common mistakes um, or maybe thought processes that you see from novice options traders? Guys, the the number one mistake we like to say when when genius fails, it's always size. <laughs> so like like anybody, th this is not the most complex business in the world. This is not rocket science by any stretch. What we do is is 
all a function of almost almost 90 plus percent of the people that don't make it it's just they just trade too big all right all right it's got some miscellaneous uh, do you have any uh more trading questions jj before i ask him just a few miscellaneous questions oh on. god i i could probably bother him for hours and hours and hours it's just uh but i uh, know i'm just uh you know uh trading questions not really because i'm not an options guy but um i'm slowly starting to oh is tasty works and, and tasty trade can you take canadian clients yet not yet but we're really close okay <laughs> really freaking close I'm, we're I'm, um I'm we're, at the last, our Canadians, we're at the yeah. last stage with the canadian regulators um the reason we're done tasty's done we're waiting for our clearing firm apex Got to it. get approval because we didn't have a clearing firm in canada nobody would clear us really so we had to get, we had to get apex to go to canada to get their clearing license so wow we're really close that's amazing yeah i i know a lot of canadians that are waiting because oh, we have we have about yeah. i don't know just under ten thousand on a canadian waiting list ready yeah. to come over to tasty as soon as we get licensed so we've been pushing for it it's just it's a freaking pain in the ass but we're gonna get I, there I, i'm one of them even though i live in the uk now i you know i don't know whether or not i can still get in there but well for, if you're in the uk you can, you can open an account with us oh well okay well here i come yeah <laughs> hey, I'm going to be in London too, June 24th. I'm going to do a wow. show over in London. Oh, I'd love to meet you. That'd be great. If you're there, June 24th, where you can sign up on Eventbrite. But June 24th, I don't know the venue yet, but it's the weekend the Cubs are playing the Cardinals. And I'm going to okay. be doing like a like an event myself. It, it should be a pretty good event. And it's going to be a lot of fun on entrepreneurship and trading. And it's going to oh, be on wonderful. June 24th. I'll send you all the info on it. That'd be great. Nice. Are, are you a are you are you a Cubs fan? Are you a is we we right. sponsor the Cubs? You know, like okay. here's the here's the thing. I hate to do this because I don't want to go off topic, <laughs> but I come from New York. I grew up as a Mets fan, okay. and when I got to Chicago, remember I didn't know where Chicago was. You know, I moved <laughs> right by Wrigley Field, but I I like both the White Sox and the Cubs, which in Chicago is almost like you're committing murder. Oh, you know, no. it's like it's you're not allowed to do this unless you come from some other place. But I do like both the, the Cubs and the, I'm a season ticket holder at for the Cubs because I live right by Wrigley Field, but I can walk from my house to Wrigley. But I like the White Sox too. Okay, all right, nice, nice. Yeah, so Chicago, Chicago, they are they're pretty hardcore fans, I guess, across the board. Um, yeah, I'm a Bears fan now. I'm a Bulls fan. I'm a Hawks fan. Yeah, I got yeah. all the Chicago teams. <laughs> That's cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I'm, a, you know, not to derail it, I'm a, but I'm interested to see what the um, Bears do with the number one pick here. Um, they're going to trade it. They're going to trade it. Yeah, as as I think they should. Um, okay, so uh, that was some sports talk here. Oh, uh, I guess well, because you did mention you uh, you do like gambling. Um, do we get any sports betting, Tom? Or do you are you venturing any of that? So we've looked at all different kinds of sports betting to potentially, you know, embed something. First of all, if you have a broker dealer, you cannot offer sports betting or political betting on the platform. It's it's not the the, the regulators. Um, they hate sports betting and political betting worse than they hate crypto. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so. that'll give them a conniption fit. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, no, that 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 that's a huge no, no regulatory wise. We we have considered. Um, we have considered running a real-time um, exchange feed for sports bets mm -hmm. on Tasty because that you're allowed to do. You're allowed to stream data, okay. um, so you can stream quotes, but you can't actually take bets or even anything like that. You know, except unless it's virtual. Got so, it. so we've considered putting a stream up there, but we have not yet, just because of you know resources and and things like that. But I don't think, you know, I thought we would be taking gambling bets by now, but but we're obviously not for regulatory reasons. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 interesting. That's why, um, but yeah, um, let's see here. Okay, uh, Tom, if you uh, you had to have a final meal, what would the meal be? Final meal. Yeah, final meal. <laughs> Last meal. Yeah. You know, I, I read about all the final, like, I'm, I don't know why you brought that up because like, I just read an article, I think it was like a couple weeks ago about like all these, um, 
you know, serial killers, all these people that were, were <laughs> they had their last meal, you know, like, like they go through the whole list of all these crazy convicts that were the weird together. ones. Yeah. And and you're sitting in front of like a pork store right there, you know, <laughs> making all this, uh, bringing back memories of, um, you know, oh, New York. I, I, boy, a final meal. I, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I probably go eggplant parm. Okay. Wow. All right. I probably oh, yeah. go eggplant parm. I'm a, I, I have a few weaknesses. That's one of them. Um, I may go Peking duck, but I don't think they <laughs> deliver that to the, you know, <laughs> I may well, go Peking duck. I probably go eggplant parm. Um, I, I'm not doing steak or fried chicken or any of that stuff. I, I'm probably going eggplant parm, but if not Peking duck, I think. Okay. All right. Yeah, all we, right. we we know food's a big, 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 big part of the culture at Tasty Trade because you know you guys would send Vanetta out to get hot dogs. And, you know, we we got it. Know? We got it. We we have to. Um, you know, trading mar trading and markets. I mean, we go for ten hours a day on this network. We we have to break it up. You know, we have to have some fun and talk exactly. about things that are. You know, talk about things that are not you know trade related. We we give you enough trading stuff on here. So we have oh, yeah. to. A lot of people watch it because they don't want to hear about trading. They just want to hear about all the other bullshit. <laughs> well, so we try to mix it. It's nice. I mean, that's something me and JJ always it, talk about too. You got to have, oh, fun yeah. it, man, sometimes it's just too dry. Like people that are just always just trade, trade. It's, oh yeah. You know, have fun it, too. It gets, it, gets, yeah. it gets to the point where you're like, all right, already enough. I've heard, you know, like I got yeah. it. I got it. You know, like I want to yeah. hear, I want to hear the real stuff, you know, exactly. like, I want to give people a taste of Chicago that don't usually get out here, you know, things yeah. like that. Uh, speaking yeah. of which, one of my favorite segments you guys ever did was the Louis Borsalino story. Uh, soul. It was really good, wasn't oh, it? Oh, I love that. I would love to speak to that guy. I mean, especially he when he, a, he's a oh, nutcase. And and this is when oh. he's clean. Imagine him when he's coked up out of his oh my mind God. for about a decade. Oh, geez. He just reminds me of the guys who taught me the business in Vancouver, you know, especially that pencil story. He sends his brother this to sharpen the pencils and he ends up beating the guy up in front of the pencil sharpener. You know, he, on the floor. He was a legit badass back in his day. You know, he really was the biggest trader on the floor of the CME. Not on, I wasn't. I was on the CBO. He yeah. was on the CME. So I didn't really know him that well. But when we did the Louis Borsalino story, the documentary, you know, like I met him and he's like such a nice guy and he's and he's so real. And, you know, and he's he's the kind of guy like like his rep. Like, I just didn't know what to expect, but I really <laughs> like him. Yeah. I really like him. I love that piece. Crazy story. I couldn't agree oh. with you more. <laughs> That's you awesome. know what I loved about that story? The story when he told, you know, his dad was in the mob, was you know, yeah. killed. But the story he told when his dad, when somebody owed his dad money and they, from the, the Blackhawks, like team manager, and <laughs> and all those mobsters went out and played hockey one night at midnight at Chicago Stadium, <laughs> pay off the debt. I thought that was one of the greatest stories I've ever heard. Oh, yeah. No great. kidding. Eh? Amazing. Yeah, that was great. That's incredible. That's that's awesome. Um, all right. So we from New York. You moved out to Chicago. I know a lot of people like to debate about the pizza, but I I assume you're a New York pizza guy, or have you switched? I have so switched so long ago. Chicago uh -oh. pizza is so much better than I can't even <laughs> really. When I have New York pizza now, and I go back to New York a lot. When I have New York pizza, it's just something's missing. I can't tell you. I uh, something's missing. Oh man, he switched. Wow. He switched up on but, us. But I will tell you this. So so I, I kind of grew up part of my life in New Haven, Connecticut. And mm -hmm. if you said to me, what's the best pizza in America? It's Pepe's. You know, it, it could be Sally's, but I'd say it's Pepe's. New Haven pizza is the best pizza in the world. Um, but Chicago over New York, I'm gonna go Chicago. Oh wow. Okay. You, you have it here, folks. You have it here from Tom. But I think uh um, okay, last thing. Uh, outside of trading, Tom, uh, what recreational activities uh, you like doing? You, you've never heard me talk about this, huh? I'm I'm hobbyless. <laughs> no, I'm I haven't. the worst. I'm hobbyless. I have <laughs> nothing. No, still I don't nothing. Do eh? any, I don't do anything. <laughs> I have nothing. I have no uh, hobbies. I don't do anything. Um, I I really, yeah, I'm pretty bad. I don't really um. I don't have anything in my life. I mean, well, I don't want to make it sound like <laughs> but I don't really do anything else. Like I build stuff, but you know, exactly. well, yeah, build that's, companies. Yep. I love building companies. I'm investing in a lot of things. I work 
all the time on all the crazy stuff I'm involved with, but I don't really have like, you know, crazy hobbies of other things. I mm -hmm. actually, I like to go around and do speeches and stuff. And I like <laughs> to do things like that, but I'm not really, I don't have like these, you know, I don't have these crazy hobbies anymore. I mean, occasionally I go to Vegas or occasionally I go on vacation, but not really. Yeah. What are you, what, what are you, uh, what are you uh, playing in when you go to Vegas? Um, well, I'm capable of playing anything, but nothing really well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever is gets hot, you know, for a few minutes, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, that's going to conclude today's episode of confessions of a market maker. If you guys enjoyed this episode, could you please rate and review it for us? If you guys would like to join a supportive and professional community of traders, you can join us at micro e futures dot com tom let the listeners know where they can find you and anything else you want them to know well my email is tom at tastylive.com anybody can reach out if you have any questions tom at tastylive.com and if you want to check us out every day um we do tasty live i'm on from seven in the morning central time till 10 do a live show with tony and um then we're also on from 2 30 to 3 in the afternoon and we do a Sunday night show. We're on all the time. We're like poop. We're all over the place. So you can find <laughs> us everywhere. And check out our technology at tastytrade.com. Excellent. J JJ, parting words. Oh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, it took me 10 years to meet you, and I'm so glad uh, we finally met you. It just uh, Thanks, JJ. And thank you for everything that you've built uh, that's allowed me to like learn and then go and teach people. Um, wouldn't be here if not for you. Thank you so much. Cool. Love it. And I'll, I'll let you know about that London thing. Sounds great. All right. Take care, so, guys. So for Tom Sovnoff, I'm Polly Walnuts. He's the gorilla of House Street. You stop, though. So.